It's like the Beastie Boys said, you gotta fight for your rights as a comic creator. I'm paraphrasing, but I, I think it went something like that. <laughs> Greetings, people of the internet. I'm Scott with CircWorks Art Labs. Welcome, mad creators, to the underground laboratory where we create robots, aliens, zombies, and other imminent threats to humanity. We also create comics, and I'm doing a series. It's sort of a mini series. I've done larger series. In fact, I did a whole series on making comics. Uh, it's called Making Comics 101. If you want to learn how to make comics, there is a playlist for that. We'll probably leave a link to that so you can check that out. But it takes you step by step how to make comics all the way from coming up with your idea to the world building, to the penciling, the inking, the publishing, uh, <laughs> marketing, everything. And anything that I didn't mention there, it is probably in there too. It's like a 22 week long course featuring three videos a week. It's massive and it'll pretty much tell you everything you need to know. So I've done these large series, but this is a little mini series that I'm doing and it's not in chronological order. I may uh, put different videos in between, but every once in a while, um, I just like to talk about indie comics because I am a big fan of indie comics and I just want to uh, sort of uh, make people aware of some of the benefits to doing indie comics, uh, some of the pitfalls to uh, the opposite of indie comics which are sort of working uh, for the bigger publishers and everything. Just to kind of because people always talk about the big guys and the characters we all know and love. L let's be honest, I love uh, Spider-Man, Batman, Superman. The Flash. I mean, all, all of those characters. I love them. I love reading them. That's what I grew up on. But you know, I somewhere along the line, I decided, you know what, I'm going to go the indie comics route, and so that's sort of what I do. So I just want to put that out as an option. And a lot of the reason why people do go into creating indie comics is because uh, you lose a lot of your your rights, quite honestly, when you do uh, work for uh, a major comic book publisher. You are basically work for hire and uh, everything you create is pretty much owned by them and you don't get any of the benefits that usually come along with a work for hire situation like benefits and them providing you with a, a workspace and computer equipment and all the things that go along with a typical a typical day job. Uh, they don't provide any of that but uh, you're giving up pretty much everything. So that's one of the reasons and I did a whole video on some of the problematic issues throughout history uh, of uh, you know of the comic book industry but uh, one thing I mentioned in there that I wanted to just do a dedicated episode and that is this here the Bill of Rights for comic book creators now this is a document that was drafted by some of the more successful independent comic creators throughout yeah I guess history I guess somewhat recent depending on how old you are these are the guys who are kind of big as far as independent when I was coming up and this was this was created a little while ago and unfortunately it is not uh, it's not like a binding document it's not something that the comic book industry really recognizes but they should and I mean this is something that if you are you know going to create comics I really think these are these are some things that you should definitely get. I mean, this is uh, fair is fair, and this is a great document. Going back to those independent comic book creators, uh, the people who drafted this, there, there were a few. Uh, some of the more notable ones are Scott McCloud. You may know him from Understanding Comics, also the creator of Zot. Uh, Dave Sim, creator of Cerebus, and of course, Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird, uh, probably the most successful independent comic book creators of all time creators of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So all of those people were huge proponents of creators' rights in comics. And so they decided to draft this document, hoping that this would sort of change the industry. And like I said, there, there have been a few of these things we'll get into. It, it wasn't all for nothing. Some of the things uh, have become common practice, not many. Uh, but these are things that should be common practice and that every creator should at least be aware of and should know sort of their rights and know what, what's fair across most other industries because the comic book industry, they kind of play by their own rules and they make their own rules and it's just, 
it's bizarre compared to what, uh, what most other industries think is fair or is commonly put in practice as fair. So I thought it would be beneficial just to go through this document, go off the different rights, and this is something that any independent comic creator, any comic creator in general should know and hopefully put into practice if possible. So yeah, let's get to it. So first of all, the Bill of Rights for Comic Book Creators. I'm gonna read this sort of introductory statement here. For the survival and the health of comics, we recognize that no single system of commerce and no single type of agreement between creator and publisher can or shall be instituted. However, the rights and dignity of creators everywhere are equally vital. Our rights, as we perceive them to be and intended to preserve them are, and then we're gonna get into the different rights. Okay, so here we go. Number one, the right of full ownership of what we fully create. So this is standard practice in almost any other industry. When you create something, I don't know if you know this or not because there's a lot of confusion on copyright and things like that, but anything you create, any artwork or whatever, once you create that, that is automatically owned by you. That is copyright you. And unless you relinquish that right via a contract to somebody else, that is owned by you. Now, when you're working in the comic book industry for a major publisher, you're always, almost always gonna sign a contract because they know that if they don't have you sign that contract, then you still own this stuff. That is your right. And again, the only way to transfer ownership of your rights, of the things that you create, the works that you create, are via contract. Now, it does say fully create, which means you know, obviously, if you're working with a team and everything, if it's a collaborative effort, then it gets a little, you know, muddy and everything. But if you create uh, an idea for a comic book, you bring it to a publisher, you should own that character, that story. Fair is fair. I mean, obviously, the publisher is going to get some, you know, benefit from that, from publishing. Uh, but the ownership of those creations should remain with you. Not always the case, but that's that's what it states in here and you know if that was if in a perfect world that that would be industry standard on to number two the right of full control over creative execution of that which we fully own so fairly self-explanatory but if you create a character you create a character a storyline or whatever then maybe you want to bring somebody else on to carry on that story you should still have some say in what happens with those characters down the road. And that's not necessarily always the case, or actually seldomly the case when you create a character for Marvel or DC. First of all, they're not gonna let you own that character. Second of all, once you create it, they're gonna be able to do whatever they want with those characters. But in a perfect world, again, once you create something, you should have some say or full say over that storyline, that, that character, those characters uh, moving forward. Moving on to number three, the right of approval over the reproduction and format of our creative property. So, you know, the work is one thing, creating that, but how it's actually put out there in the world, the format, the whether you want to do it as a floppy comic or a trade paperback, whether you want to do distribute as whether you want a digital format out there, that should be, you should be able to decide what kind of format you want. Uh, if you want like a really nice deluxe version of your book, you don't always have to say if you're working in the, you know, the industry the way it is, they're going to decide whatever format format they think is right for that comic book and maybe that's not exactly how you intended it but it should be and that's what this uh, creator's bill of rights is all about all right so here we go number four the right of approval over methods by which our creative property is distributed so whether we're putting our book out there uh, through the internet floppy comics whether if it's distributed through the direct market whether it's in bookstores different retail outlets I've always advocated that comic books should be distributed at you know movies if there's a movie right if there's a movie out there uh, you know featuring your hero or whatever why aren't there comic books there for people to purchase at the movie theater that would be something that I would like to see but we don't always have control over how our comics are distributed all right moving on to uh, number five the right to free movement of ourselves and our creative property to and from publishers so say you create a property you're publishing it through image comics and you know maybe things aren't going well 
at that particular publisher and you want to take it somewhere else or you want to publish the next uh, iteration of that book through crowdfunding under your own banner, whatever the case is, you shouldn't be pinned down to that particular publisher. You should be allowed to either go somewhere else or take that particular property somewhere else. Fair enough, I think. And number six, the right to employ legal counsel in any and all business transactions. This one, I'm not really sure if that's something if you could be under contract somewhere or, or any situation where you wouldn't be allowed to do that, but maybe it's possible. I would think, I, I, at least in this country, you could, you could pretty much sue for anything. So I don't think there's anything stopping anyone, but maybe, maybe I'm wrong with that one. But anyway, that's interesting that that's in there. Um, obviously, you want the right to uh, have somebody negotiate or whatever on your behalf. Maybe that's more what it has to do with is negotiating. Maybe if it's not like a dispute over rights or something like that. But, but yeah, when you, that makes sense actually. So if you are, you know, if you're working on some sort of either a contract or partnership or whatever the case is, uh, to have somebody that can help you legally to make sure that you're not being taken advantage of, because I could see a situation where uh, a publisher might be like, oh no, we don't, you know, we don't need that or whatever. Well, we can take care of this ourselves <laughs> and discourage you from getting somebody that will represent you. So that's probably what that one is all about, I'm guessing. On to number seven. So the right to offer a proposal to more than one publisher at a time. And yeah, this is something that I've, you know, I know that there are, in, in, at least in like, I know with like when submitting ideas to publishers, at least outside of, I mean, I've always published my own comic books myself, haven't really presented them to a comic book publisher, but I have had, you know, ideas for like children's books and, and other properties like that, that I, or entertainment properties where I have shopped around. And I know it, typically there is sort of a, this idea that you should send something and at least have some sort of a waiting period before you send to somebody else. But who knows how long that is. I think that rule is sort of done out of respect. Give somebody a chance to look at it and, and then either prove on it or, you know, <laughs> or decide that they want to pass on it or whatever the case is. But sometimes <laughs> you're, just, you're just sitting there. If you send something to a publisher and you got to sit there and wait, twiddling your thumbs for them to get some kind of answer, a lot of times people don't respond at all. It depends on, I guess, your relationship moving in and whether that's a solicited, uh, whether it's uh, solicited or unsolicited. Uh, when you're presenting that, if it's if it's solicited, then they know about it and then you should be waiting for that. But if it's sort of an unsolicited situation where they don't even know that you're sending it, you should definitely be able to send more than one out at a time and, and see what happens. So um, yeah, that's a pretty uh, pretty fair rule. And just knowing that sometimes it is um, courteous to uh, you know give somebody a chance to either you know say yay or nay on whether they want to uh, publish your particular property. All right, so I've got this. Uh, let's go on to the next page here. This is number eight: the right to prompt payment and fair and equitable share of profits derived. Yeah, derived from all of your creative work. So, you know, that, that is sort of self-explanatory. You, you want to be able to be paid in a timely fashion and a fair amount for the work that you're doing. I don't know that that's always the case. I've heard of publishers that that do not pay on time, that you're constantly waiting for. Um, the, the bigger publishers, I would assume they pay on time. Uh, but you know, that's not the case with some, some smaller or, you know, some of the, once you get down from those first couple tiers of, of like the big two, I've heard some of the other pet publishers don't always pay on time. So you have to worry about that. But as far as adequate compensation for, for the work that you're doing, in my opinion, uh, and it is, you know, who knows how much titles sell. If you go back to the, the video that I put out previously talking about indie comics and sort of this whole idea of comics will break your heart, kid, that whole Jack Kirby saying and, and the reason why that is. Um, I talked about how even if it's a not a, even if the comic book isn't like selling massive amounts, there's still value in that because that's still a property and it's still being, uh, you know, bringing awareness. and. 
it shouldn't necessarily be up to you uh, how well that comic sells because a lot of these situations you don't have any say over that other than I mean obviously if your artwork isn't that great it's not gonna sell if your artwork is great and your stories are great it will probably sell more but a lot of that also lies uh, with the publisher and how they're getting that out there so you don't really have any say over you know how that book's selling but whatever the case is I think the rate page rates that are being paid for most comics um, considering many of these comics and maybe they aren't but it, it's it is a business and uh, the ones that do sell the ones that are profitable are leading to in the case of the big two these giant movie franchises and things I mean that's where everything emanates from and the, the, the money that's being paid for those original ideas that could possibly turn into something that you may see on the big screen and that is just raking in billions of dollars, uh, I don't think the compensation that you're getting is, is, is fair, to be quite honest. So yeah, that would be nice though. <laughs> And that leads us to number nine, which is sort of an extension of what we talked about before with the compensation, but the right to full and adequate accounting for all the income and disbursements relative to the work. So you should have access, you should know how many copies that your book is actually selling, how much money it's bringing in, all of those things, uh, because <laughs> that's stuff that they might want to hide from you, because like I said, sometimes they don't want to let you know how much money they're actually you know earning off of this and again that may not be from the sales of the comic book but there's there's more to you know creating these properties than the comics themselves there are like i said there are movies tv shows animated features whatever the case there are toys there are t-shirts there are all these other merchandising uh other books and different formats whether you know it's not just the comic books later if they do that in a trade you should be aware of sort of the accounting uh and what what those books are bringing in that's uh definitely you know, makes sense for that to be in this uh, bill, comic creator's bill of rights. All right, on to number 10, and there are 12 of these, I don't know if I mentioned, but we're getting, we're rounding the corner, we're at number 10, and that is the right to prompt and complete return of all our artwork in its original condition. So, in case you didn't know, when you create artwork, it is owned by you, unless it, you have a contract stating that you are relinquishing that right and giving that right to that original artwork over to over to the publishers uh, that is yours to keep and nowadays it wasn't always this way but nowadays that is standard practice that you that the artist does get to keep the original artwork but that is not to say that you know it, and, and now everything a lot of things are done more digitally and even if it's not done digitally if you're doing something uh, traditionally you don't necessarily have to send it away to have them scan it and reproduce it and everything a lot of times you can scan that yourself and uh, so you you don't always have to worry about the return of that artwork but you never know I mean maybe if you're doing color cover artwork or whatever maybe you don't have the setup to properly photograph that or whatever so you might send that work out um, but it is <laughs> is coming upon them to make sure that they're not damaging that when they get it and that you get that back uh, in, in one piece and in a timely fashion because who knows I mean they could just hold it and might not make it a priority so definitely this having this in here it makes sure that you get that back in a timely fashion. I don't think any of these are too much to ask. Okay, now, uh, number 11, the right to full control over licensing of our creative property. So, uh, a perfect example of this is, I, I when I think of licensing, and I'm not opposed to licensing your product on a number of different things. Uh, I, I would be hesitant to have it put on like cheap tchotchkes and things like that. And there are different schools of thought on this. When you think, uh, when I think licensing, I think of Bill Watterson, the creator of Calvin and Hobbes. He famously uh, decided that the only reproduction any way that he wants of Calvin and Hobbes is just the books, the comics themselves. And that can be done in different formats. Uh, you know collections and things like that but that's just the comics anything other than the comics he is totally against you will never see I mean you see those little Calvin's uh, peeing on stuff or your 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 
least favorite sports team or whatever on the back of trucks and stuff like that. Those are bootlegs. There is no official Calvin and Hobbes merchandise anywhere because Bill Watterson is against that. He thinks it should just be just the, the comics, the artwork themselves. He doesn't want there to be an animated film. He wants your imagination to, to decide what the voice of Calvin is like in your head, not to assign that over to a voice actor and everything. So you're not going to see anything like that, any official merchandise of Calvin and Hobbes. I really admire Bill Watterson for that because he is turn, literally turning away or has turned away billions of dollars and I'm sure the syndicate that published uh, Calvin and Hobbes uh, did not uh, agree with that because they probably would have got some kind of cut on that or but but yeah he would he has a strong standpoint on there and he sticks to it I'm not so much against that I don't have a really problem with uh, making money off of uh, your property but there uh, to me there is a line to be drawn and that is just like those cheap cheap things that are gonna break or just things that don't really uh, align themselves with the you know the the idea or the theme behind your comic so you want the the ability to say no I don't I don't want my comic featured on that you know cheap piece of plastic toy that's gonna break after kids play with it for you know 10 minutes or whatever or whatever the case is or or maybe it's a, a you know I don't want it on too many different things maybe I just want it only on certain things and I don't I just don't want it all over the place but you should whatever the case is I'm not here to say what's right what's wrong whether Bill Watterson is crazy a little crazy but but I, I like I said I I admire him for that stance because I don't know if I could do that turn away that kind of money but anyway you should have the right to decide what your art what, what your comics your characters and everything are reproduced and you know what what kind of licensing deals and all that kind of stuff you should have that choice it's your character you created it and you should you should have some say in what happens to it after the fact Okay, and uh, finally, number 12, the right to promote and the right of approval over any and all promotion of ourselves and our creative property. So how you market this thing, how, how you're getting the word out, how you yourself are attached to that. Maybe you want to distance yourself for whatever reason from that. Uh, you, should ha you should have the right to do, I mean, Alan Moore is a pretty good example. A lot of what's been done with his creations uh, he's a good example of a lot of the things in here that have, he's kind of said, no, I don't agree with this and I don't want to have anything to do with it. Don't attach my name to it. I don't even want royalties from this because it's not what I was creating. I mean, you can watch interviews with Alan Moore and get more of his opinion on that. Uh, you should have the right to how you are represented, how you are attached. Yeah, and anyways, you should have the right to how your comic books are promoted and how you're being promoted, whether together or <laughs> whatever the case is. But yeah, so that that is it. That's the 12 rights that are in the Comic Creators Bill of Rights. I think it's good just to know about these. Even like I said, you know, in today's comic book industry, you're lucky if you... If you if you get them to agree with all that, that's great. Uh, that's probably not going to be the case. But, you know, like I said, that's kind of why I'm sort of an indie comic creator because I get to decide all of this stuff. And, uh, yeah, that's just sort of the route that I go. But it's up to you. But, like I said, you need to sort of understand this. And I think these are just some really good things to think about, if nothing else. So, yeah, that is the Comic Creator's Bill of Rights. And that's going to do it for another issue here. Uh, I will see you guys later, and that is all. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like what you saw and you want to see more, hit that subscribe button. Also, you can follow me at Surfworks on social media. And now you can support the work that I do on Patreon. If you like making comics, then go to Surfworks.com and pick up the Comic Maker Starter Kit. It's packed full of fonts, brushes, templates, and more. And best of all, it's totally free.